but implant dentistry, factors that we need to, obviously bone quality, okay? And there's different sizes that fit in different locations, okay? You don't want to place like a 7-0 implant for number seven or eight, whatever. It doesn't fit there. Diameter, I'm talking about diameter. Uh, and your implant positioning, angulation, obviously implant depth. And then implant to implant distance, implant to tooth distance. These are critical factors that you need to be cognizant of them, keep in mind. These are very, imp so all these things play a role from a restorative standpoint down, crown down basically. Um, so like a central, usually, you know, it's like four or five, 4.5 uh, millimeter in diameter. Um, you know, lateral incisors like 3.8, whatever. Um, molars 4.5 or greater, basically. I, I prefer bigger implants in the back molars because if you place a skinny implant like a 3.0 or 3.5, it's, it's, yeah, it's very tiny and then it, you, the emergence doesn't look right, number one. Number two, with the strong bite forces, it can fracture the implant. If you ever have a fractured implant in the back area and you need to take that implant out, um, and it's flowered, let's just say the implant's flowered, right? It's not easy, because you have to trephine or you have to trough around that implant to take it out, so you have to create a lot of damage to be able to, you know, and, and you're probably what's gonna happen is you're gonna have to take that implant out and place another implant in there, but if you create more damage to the bone, then it's gonna be a, a lot more challenge, basically. So those are things that you don't want to do. So if you start with the good principles, then, you know, and try and maintain the, you know, maintain the balance of the principles, then you won't run into those type of problems, basically. So anterior mandible obviously is thinner, smaller, so even 3.5, 3.0 sometimes, or whatever, even minis, whatever, in the anterior mandible, it depends on the location, basically. Um, and premolars, 4, 4.5, and molars, 4.5 or 5 or bigger, basically, once again, in, in the lower jaw as well, too. So, um, and then, obviously, from tooth to, tooth to implant, we want to have at least 1.5 millimeters from tooth to implant distance. And from implant to implant, we say three millimeters, basically. And then you want buccal lingually about one millimeter of bone, basically. So you want the implant to be completely 100% surrounded by bone. That's what we want. That's the most ideal. But if you look at it from a resort, like a prosthetic standpoint, the central fossa, central fossa, central fossa, central fossa, right? So it follows the central fossa, right? From a tooth standpoint, right? So if you look at it from a restore standpoint, that's where it should, it should follow. Like, so I went to, I visited a lab here in, in, in LA, and I was looking at some of the cases, and the screw, so some of the, like these cases, I, I prefer to do most of my restorations screw routine, okay? So I might be a little bit lingual, I might be a little bit buccal or whatever, but I'm usually close to the central fossa. But I've noticed some of the cases at the lab, they're like way mesial, like tilted like this, in bad angulation number one way buckle where the screw hole is coming out the buckle cusp almost like here not right you know, bad placement basically and so or way lingual like here like here in this area not right i mean so you have to keep this in mind it's, you have to remember that implants should be restoratively driven not implant not from the implant up you should you have to think from implant like the crown down basically we need to think that but we always we also want to make sure that we use we maintain these principles, okay? Like the implant, the implant distance is three. So it's hard to like when you when you look at it like this, it's easy to look. But when you're when you're in the mouth, you don't have anything. You're like, oh, how like so? I don't know. Like depending upon the size of the implant that you're gonna place, like what distance is this supposed to be? What distance is this supposed to be? It's, it's hard. It's hard to calculate. It's hard to calculate. It's not easy. So there's there's easier ways. But I mean, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, okay? Anterior regions, you never want to be too buckle. If you place an implant too buckle, it's, it's like, it's aesthetic standpoint, it's, it's nightmare. It's detrimental nightmare. It's like the worst thing. You can err on the lingual, because you can have a cantilever buckle and still have a good aesthetic outcome. But if you're too buckle, like, you can't hide the metal. You can't, it's, it's hard to hide the metal. It's just, it's, it's unaesthetic. And then also, the space that you need, right? So minimum space that you need, as far as things go, between the teeth and the implants. You have to make sure that these, per, this per, these principles are maintained. You don't ever want to lose these principles. So you have to always think of it from a restorative standpoint. And then you have to remember the biological width of you know, our, our natural teeth. So the question that a lot of people ask is, how deep am I supposed to go? How deep am I supposed to go? And so it depends upon the buccal plate. Like especially on anterior cases, and as I said, it's very tough, but you go to the depth of where the buccal plate is here. Like, so you want to match this, because you have to remember the biological width is always going to be there, right? It's biological width, you have to maintain it. You have to maintain it, because if you violate it, things are not, tissue's not going to be happy, things are not going to be happy, you lose it, basically. So, and then you have to remember, you have to also be cognizant about the, the prosthetic height, right? I mean, ideally, you want nine millimeters, nine to 10 millimeters of prosthetic height, basically, because you have to have enough space for the crown, you have to have enough space for the abutment, um, because 
it's all about physics. If you're, you know, we do, we have zirconia crowns now, whatever, and titanium abutments. But the problem is, if these are too thin, you know, patients bite, it'll fracture. Things will fracture. Things are gonna, something's gonna give somewhere, you know? And you have these big burly guys that are strong with big fat, like, you know, square jaws that can, like, grind the heck out of teeth. You put, like, a, you know, like a five millimeter height, whatever, tooth crown with the abutment under. Like, so your, your crown's only less than a millimeter. It's gonna break. It's not gonna stay. It's not going to stay. So you have to kind of keep that in mind, you know. So in the back, like number 1831 site, I was talking about one case a couple of days ago where I was like, oh, I'm worried about the occlusal clearance, right? So I said, use a UCLA above and use a gold crown, basically. One piece screw retain, you know, gold crown, basically. It's all one piece. So you don't have to worry about nothing fracturing, nothing coming out, you know. So sometimes it's called for. I mean, even though aesthetically it's not the best looking thing, but it, it, it's, it'll last. It'll function. It'll last for a long time. So, And then obviously, you know, you have to have inner inner... In our space, you have to have sufficient space. Seven millimeters for just the single tooth in the posterior or whatever, um, eight to ten in the anterior region, and then all, you know, like the all on X cases obviously requires more. So that's the reason why for the bone reduction and all that stuff. Because there's like, you know, whatever appliance that you're gonna make, there's bars or whatever whatnot that, that is required. So and then obviously proper angulation. This is very, very important. I, I notice like when I'm training people, it's like they're they don't get a grasp or a picture of the proper angulation of how implants are supposed to go. I think it's very critical that you see the picture. Once you see the picture, I think it becomes easy, right? It's, but the problem is people don't see the picture. People just don't see the proper angulation picture, how it's supposed to go. Um, and so, you know, it's, the force is always in the mouth. It's always towards the functional cusp. It's, it should be pointing towards the functional cusp. Because why? Implants like a direct force up and down. But if you put something force like this where you're putting the implant like this, it doesn't like it. It doesn't really like it. All on X is a little bit different. Like you, you're like, well, how come all of those all on fours or whatever is like, you have the implants like this and then you have implants here though, right? But the balance of force between this here and this with the multi-angled abutment like this, it kind of offsets this pressure here. So that's the reason why it actually likes it because it's not a single standing implant that's holding that in that direction there. So, but a single implant, it actually likes the forces up and down, not sideways, okay? So this is why for long-term success, having properly placed implants is beneficial, it's so critical, so important. So once again, proper angulation, you know? And don't, uh, and you know, try not to be satisfied with something, you're like, you take an x-ray and you're like, oh, that looks, half, like, that looks halfway decent, we can go with it. Up your game, try, you know, step up, you know, try to, try to do it, and there's, there's ways to correct it, there's ways to correct it. Like even with your first drill, second drill, remember the parallel guide thing we're using and stuff like that, right? Most people skip steps, most people don't do it. And even though they're not very good, they still skip the steps. They shouldn't, you shouldn't. You should try to, you know, maintain the basic principles all the time, okay? And the length. Usually lower jaw, the bone is very good, it's dense, it's, it's, it's good bone. D, we talked about D1, D2, D3 bone in, in the lower jaw. So lower jaw, the, since the bone is dense, eight and a half millimeter, 10 millimeter length are sufficient. You don't have to be a hero and place like 13 millimeter or 15 millimeter implant on the, on the lower jaw. It's unnecessary, it's not, it's not required. It's, why do I say it's unnecessary? Let's just say you place a 13 millimeter implant on the lower jaw and the bone is like a D2 bone. You have, and we talked about earlier placing like a skinnier diameter implant and crap happened and you have a flowered implant, 13 millimeter length implant or 15 millimeter implant. Let's just, you need to remove that. How, how much, how easy you think that's gonna be to remove a 15 millimeter implant in the lower jaw when it's, when it's integrated, when it's osteo integrated and it's, it's flowering or something that's cracked? It's hell. It's, if, even if when you're trying to remove a 10 millimeter length implant, it's hell. If you guys ever done it, it's, it's hell, it's not easy. You have to, you have to remove quite a bit of bone to get to it basically. And even, even when you're like almost two thirds of the way down onto the implant, like you know, on 10 millimeter implant, you'll be like, it's not budging, it's just not budging. And you can't use one of those implant removers to remove because the implant's flowering. So it's just, there's nothing to grab onto. So you have to try find or create, you know, trough around the implant to try and remove it. It's hell. And because it's hell, because as I said, if you can remove the buccal plate, all, you damage the bone, it's not a big deal. You, you just whatever, it's, it'd be easy, but that's not the case, right? Because we're, we have to replace the implant again with something else, so it's hell. So don't be a hero. Like eight, eight and a half, 10 millimeter length is perfectly fine for a lower jaw. Upper jaw, so usually, you know, you, it, the bone is not as dense, okay? So the longer, 11.5, whatever, 13, if, you, if, if needed, is possible, but we can go, we have the sinus, all this stuff, structures that are in the way. So fatter and shorter is always good, like six by 8.5, whatever, in the posterior mandible, maxilla is, is very good, five by 8.5, whatever, stuff like that, you know? So shorter and fatter if you can. And then 
we talked about <clears throat> with two, f with regular T, you know, the crown to root ratio is kind of important. You don't want the crown to be like two to one flip flop, right? But it, with implants, it's not, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's not, you don't have to worry about it. So this is why I say on the lower jaw, you don't have to have a, whatever, 15 millimeter implant because you're, whatever, it's not necessary. It's, it's not necessary. And once again, studies have shown that implants crown to root ratio is not is not is irrelevant almost basically. So it doesn't matter if it's flip flop or whatnot. You know, you can still make it work on the lower jaw or whatever in the jaw, as far as implant to crown ratios. And anterior bendable, you know, as I said, the space is pretty tight. So sometimes it requires minis. It requires mini implants. You know, this is where minis play a role, or whatever, because you don't have enough space. You can't like in this, you can't place like even like a 3.0 implant sometimes is too tight. It's too tight for place in there. So you just have to use, sometimes you have to use the skinnier implants down there. Unfortunately, that's, that's what's required. So calculating space, right? We talked a little bit about calculating space. How do you calculate the space, right? So you're looking, you're, you're looking at it on paper, and so it's easy. So whatever, this is a four, whatever. So three, 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 you know, when you, when you calculate this, it might look easy, but in the mouth, it's not easy, right? So how do you, what makes it easy? What makes, how can we calculate where it should be 1.5, where should be three, right? So... We're always, I always say, you gotta look at it from tooth down, okay? Not from, not from implant up. You gotta look at it from the other way. From, so think of, like, think of yourself as being a lab technician, right? So think of yourself as making the crown on the tooth. Before you look at the, the bony structures, whatever's underneath, think of the tooth being on top of there. Think of a, you know, imagine the tooth going on top of that implant that you're gonna be placing. That's, that's how you should be thinking. That's, that should be your mindset. That should be your visual that you're getting with this. So it should, be, it should be prosthetically driven. This is very important. This is super important. So if you do, if you think of an average molar, it's about 10 millimeters, basically. Average molar is about 10. Premolar, we say about eight millimeters in the width. And so if you think of it as uh, restoratively, I mean, you know, restorative driven down, right? So what's, what's 10 minus five? It's five, right? So your center of your implant, like your implant positioning should be five millimeters from here, basically. And then you sh that should be your first toll. It doesn't matter what fixture size you're placing because you can place a five diameter, six diameter, 4.5, 4 whatever. It's still going to be centered in that, in that restoration. So it's in the central fossa, it'd be center of wherever that restoration is, basically. That's how it should be driven. That's how you, that's how you should be thinking, basically. Average width of teeth, this is pretty, like a kind of an average summary, basically. Um, you know, and so in the posterior, but this is very relevant, like in the back, you know, like, because you have like number 18, number 31, as we placed um, a couple of days ago. Um, and you, you're like, you know, when you try and place the implant, you're like, where, where do I start my first hole, right? It's always kind of a, it's like, it's kind of, it's tough. It's tough. And if you're, if you're off by even a millimeter, right? If you're off just by a millimeter, you'll have like a, either a mesial or distal cantilever, one or the other, basically, where the implant's like kind of off center. It's not the most ideal. So, so this is the easier way to look at it, basically. You know, it's like if you look at a molar, 10 millimeters, so you should be like five centered, right? If you have a premolar that's like eight millimeters, it should be four centered. If it's seven, if it's seven whatever, it's 3.5 centered, basically. That's how you should think. That's how you should think as far as your calculations go. Um, and so, and you also want to make sure that the, you know, we talked about the basic principles, right? You want to have bone everywhere, right? One millimeter of bone surrounding the implant there. So you always want to follow the basic principles, right? In the anterior region, once again, you always want to be more lingual and you want to maintain that buccal plate, the thicker buccal plate. So, so always, always, if you're going to err, err on the palate, never on the buccal. Because if you err, err, and then also the depth, you don't want to be too deep, you don't want to be too shallow either. Because like on, this is why anterior cases are a little bit more tougher too, because of this, you know. So if you're too deep, um, it's, uh, if you're too buckled, this is what happens. And so, th and it looks ugly as hell. It looks very, very ugly. And so if you have a patient that has a high smile line, and they try to smile, like you can do like pink porcelain like this, and you can't, it's hard to mask. It just doesn't look right. It just doesn't look right. So it's a nightmare if that happens, you know? So don't ever, don't ever err on, towards the buckle, you know? So I, so I'm gonna tell you a story. It's, uh, I had a case, so I do like um, cases, I mean, um, <clears throat> courses in Indiana. And so one of the doctors came and took a surgical guided case in Indiana. And so she, she did the case, right? And then so she's like, um, so this case came back to me. So she came, she brought the case to me afterwards and uh, I was looking at it and she's like, how am I gonna restore this? I said, why, what's going on? And so the implant is kind of like, is, uh, is there like a multi-angled abutment that I can use to try and angle my implant back down? And then, so and she said, I did the surgically guided. And so I was like, well, good, it must, it must be good, right? So. Once again, back to the doctors, right? It's us ultimately that's responsible to accept the case and approve the case. So 
And remember, a lot of times the technicians, I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, but I'm just saying the technicians are just looking at the bone, okay, whatever. They're not really looking, sometimes they're not looking at it from a tooth, right? And so the implant, the way I was planned, was positioned way buckle because the bone was like this, whatever, the bridge. So, but it should have been planned more like this. But they didn't plan it like that. She just approved the case and did the case. And then, so now, she's married to a case. It's, it's become a nightmare that she's married to. And she did it guided. And so she thought, oh, it's all good, you know? But it's not all good. It's not all good. Because it's like, how are you going to restore the case? I said, well, she asked me, so what am I supposed to do? So I said, uh, that implant needs to be removed, and we can re replace it with another implant. We have to do some bone graft in that area, basically. So that's how you're going to correct it. So it, it's not easy, right? Now it's become a very difficult procedure now. So, so always think. Maintain the ba basic principles. Even though you maintain the basic principles, on top of the basic principles, remember from a prosthetic standpoint too. You know, that's key. Prosthetic standpoint is key. So you have to think of it from the crown down. Always think of it from the crown down. So it, ma it makes it harder. It makes it a lot more tougher, right, when you think of it. Because there's so many variables, and then the bone is not always where you want it to be. It's not always the case. Unfortunately, life doesn't happen in that way, you know. So, so you know, if you have too, too wide or too thin, too close, too wide or whatever, you lose papilla in the anterior cases, you know. So, and too deep, too shallow, you lose papilla. So this is where it's, it's so critical. Anterior cases are a lot more difficult because of that, just because of that reason. It's so much more difficult. It takes more training. And so how do you know when, you, when you're going to have papilla, when you're not going to have papilla, right? So they show, the study showed that, you know, from the crest of the ridge here to the bone to where the point is, contact point is, if you have five millimeters, about 100%, 99% of the time, you get, you get your papilla back, okay? But if it, so as you get further away, the percentage keeps on decreasing. It keeps on decreasing. So you have to keep that in mind. So these are the, it's all about biological width. It's all about maintaining things, you know? So, so anterior, as I said, anterior implants, you know? If you're transposed on your implant placement, just a little bit more buckle or a little bit more lingual, you can, that's going to determine the fate of a screw retain or a cement retain restoration, okay? And so not only that, but, you know, just from an aesthetic standpoint, too. So it, it, it's, it's only a millimeter difference. And as I, we had a little conversation earlier, Dentistry is stressful. We deal with half a millimeter, microns, whatever it is. You know, we deal with tiny little whatever. That probably doesn't mean nothing to anybody else. You know, lab techs, they know because they, they want the margins to fit perfectly to whatever the dye that's there or whatever the, you know, the margin that we set on tooth. And it has to have a perfect fit. So it's, it makes our field or our profession very, very stressful because it's all about accuracy. It's all about whatever, you know. So, so it's, it's very, very critical that you, have, you keep these things in mind. <clears throat> As I said, bone anatomy in the anterior region is completely different. Everybody has so much different variations of their bone anatomy that anterior mandible, uh, anterior maxilla, even the anterior mandible as well too. Uh, if you're, you're going to place implants, I definitely recommend CBCT before starting anything. You know, I can't re-emphasize re the importance of CBCT because the tooth orientation is all different. It's all different. Sometimes it's very, it's super buckle. Sometimes it's like super buckle. It's like outside, almost outside the buckle plate buckle. Uh, and so it's like it just it just depends. Everybody has different different vari variations of their of the teeth, basically. And sometimes, like past the apex, there's like no bone. This is very classic too, like this. This is super classic classic phenomenon. It's on the lower jaw too. That happens so much on the lower anterior mandible. Like when you look at the CBCT, it's like you have the tooth and then there's nothing. There's no bone. It's just a very thin ridge. That's it. So it's like it makes it super difficult, you know. So things make it it's, it makes it much more challenging. So, so CBCT is so important because so you can see the data, so, so you can get the information, so you can get this knowledge. So this this is where like you know I talked a little bit about like because you you want to be because of the ridge shape, on on like this. Even if it's like this, we still start the osteotomy more like this, and we're placing the implant like kind of like here. So if you want a screw retain restoration, it's going to be on the lingual. It's always going to be on the lingual. So after the extraction, you place the implant. Your implant should be towards the lingual, okay? And so this is why we create the osteotomy like three to four millimeters up above the apex, and we start the osteotomy from there, and we go back down to create our space for our fixtures there, basically. So anterior cases, I mean, it's just, it requires some more training. So I, I definitely don't think that it should be your first case. <laughs> but if once you examine the data, you see all the, you know, CBCT, then you can, you can consider taking on the case or not. If, it's, if the root form is like, you know, straight, whatever, you have plenty of ridge, plenty, then it's not, it's not a difficult case. I mean, if, you just have to be mindful of the biological width and all that stuff, basically, and the depth control and all that is very critical. But it's not a difficult case if that's the case. But like that earlier, you know, when you don't have bone like this, 
or whatnot, like this, you know, or you know, some, something where it's like this, you have to be more cognizant of how the angulation is going to go, then it becomes more challenging. It's, it's not as easy. It's not as easy. So it's, it's more difficult when, the, when those cases arise. So, and always be mindful of your angulation. Teeth always have a mesial tilt. Teeth have a natural mesial tilt. Um, so, you know, and I talked to, we talked about this last time. This is a very common mistake that happens to beginner implants. Um, so this happens super commonly. Do, you know how often it happens? So during COVID, my mom, she, she ended up losing two, teeth, two premolars on the bottom. And so she, went, she lives in Sacramento. I live in Indiana. So she, it was during COVID and she's like, she, so she went to my, one of my um, friend dentists in Sacramento. I don't know him. I, like, I, I know him from, I don't know his clinical skills. I don't know how well he does things. I don't know how, how he is a clinical dent, like, clinician as far as things go, or how good his implant skills are. And she's like, yeah, he told me I can get him, like he'll do the implant here or whatever, and he'll, he'll, he'll do it kind of cheap or whatever. So I said, why don't you just wait to come to me? You know, I'll, I'll take care of it. It's like, nah, I don't want to go without teeth here. And my teeth are bothering me. So she went and got the teeth taken out, like two of them, like tw number 20, 20 or 21 and number 28. or I, Something was wrong with them. So anyways, so she comes back and she tells, she took a PA, right? It's like, son. Why does this implant look like this? I, I know my other implants that you place don't look like this, and this one looks like this. That's exactly what it looks like. Why does this happen? Why does this happen? So why does this happen? So when you guys are creating the osteotomy, what do we do when we create the osteotomy? We push, we push, we push, we push, we push. So as you push, as you push, as you push, as you push, your angulation starts to deviate. This is what happens. It's just the natural tendency of us, because you don't see. You don't see in the mouth. You don't see. So on the, like on, the, on the right side, number 28 is more straight. But I think it was placed way too buckle too, though. It doesn't look right. But anyways, number 20, the other side, it looks exactly like this. So this is a very common mistake. And I told you this during the surgery. And so this is everybody. I see this, everybody, whoever's starting with implant, implant surgeries, I see this so often. I see it so often. So one of my mom's like, what, what am I going to do? I say, She's like, what are you going to do, son? You're going to fix it for me? And he's like, I have to take it out. And he's like, yeah, you, later on, you got to fix it for me, right? And I say, okay, if it bothers you, I'll take it out and fix it. So i got to fix it for some time. So this, remember we talked about the positioning, right? So positioning. So if you're just even, like, it's supposed to be here, but even if you're off just by a little bit here, you still have a cantilever towards the mesial. This, this happens very often, too, because you don't, you, it's hard to visualize the spacing sometimes. So, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard, but you have, use the tools, you know, there's, there's like the, you know, we, we, like, like the parallel guide kit or whatever, you know, it, use those tools, it's there, it's there. If you use the tools, it helps you. I, and just know, you got to know how to use the tools too, but if you use the tools, it helps you. It's there to help you. And remember, as I said, teeth have that tilt, it has that natural tilt, so you have to maintain the angulation. So when you're creating the osteotomy here, you know, when you start the osteotomy, if you're centered here, you have to maintain this. You have to keep going down in this manner as you're going down. You have to keep going down like this. Not like keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, and you go like this. If this came any closer to here, you would damage the root of the next tooth, basically. That happens a lot, too. I see that often, too, where people do that. So, so maintain parallelism. You know, th this, is, like, this is a very well-placed implant. Like, look, it's very parallel to the tooth in front of it, basically. That's, that's what you want. That's, what you, that's, that's very ideal. So next, soft tissue management. I think this is the most important thing when it comes. To, so there's so many important things when it comes to dentistry or. In, in